Hi, everybody. As usual, Friday, free questions and answers. I read your questions out loud, and I try to answer them one by one. The first question is, uh, you said Europe is dying. What are the causes? Are Russia and China rising territories based on your impression fundamentally different from Europe? Um, indeed, I said that Europe is in trouble. I, I'm, I'm not sure I said dying, but maybe it is the right definition of uh, of the what's happening there. But again, I'm not a I'm not an economist. I'm not a politician. I'm not really understanding. Uh, I do not I do not understand the uh, really what's going on there. What what are the deep uh, the, the root causes of what's what's happening there? And I don't uh, have the numbers. I mean, I'm just like you. I'm just a programmer. But I've been there, so I saw myself how Europe looks right now and how Europe looked. 20 years ago, and I can compare, and the same I can do with China, and the same I can do with Russia. I can't really say that I, I've been in China 20 years ago. That was That's definitely not true, but I can understand how China looked 20 years ago, because I've been there just half a year ago, and I, 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 I can't imagine how this territory uh, was looking 20 years ago. That was not good-looking territory. It was extremely poor country. Uh, if you look at the, the the buildings, like high, you know, many the buildings with many ceilings in in China, you will see that all the windows, all of them, no matter which is the ceiling, uh, they have the cages to protect, as far as I understand, to protect the people inside the building from the people outside of the building. So, uh, and that's what, and that's you can see this. You can see in every single building in China, no matter what is the city, if the building is older than 10 years. So you can imagine what was happening there 30 years ago. It was an extremely poor territory. Now it's a different story there. So we see that the territory is going up. But if you look at Europe, if you look how they look right now, the streets of Europe, the, the, the way people live, the, the amount of money they make, and compared to what we saw 20 and 30 years ago, then definitely you see the difference. So if you're asking me what are the causes, like why it's happening, well, we can only speculate here, but I think that the main cause is that um, uh, is that um, maybe it's just it just happens because um, I can't even formulate. It's difficult to say what is the real cause of that. Well, most people would say that because United States of America is using Europe as a weapon, as a tool as an armor in the war with China and Russia. This is the, the, this is the official uh, answer if you, if you ask some, uh, some people who are, uh, are pro-Russian people and pro-Chinese people, the politicians, they will tell you this story that Europe is, uh, is a weapon. The, Europe, the, the United States is sacrificing Europe in order to win the war. I'm not sure this is exactly correct, uh, but uh, I think there is, it's just, uh, uh, I think it's the result, what we see in Europe is the result of the extreme attention, extreme attention which people in Europe and countries in Europe and politicians in Europe and people in Europe pay to the, uh, to the problem of tolerance. So they were trying to be as uh, liberal, as tolerant, as progressive as possible for many, many decades, not just years, but decades. And, and this is the price they pay. So they were extremely welcoming immigrants, for example. They were welcoming people with uh, very progressive and different points of view. They were welcoming people who, um, who, are, who have different uh, points of views on their social and uh, political and uh, sexual orientation and, and all different kinds of orientations. So they were provoking chaos, to put it this way. So instead of cultivating uh, dis discipline, cultivating control, cultivating some sort of, a, uh, of social rules and uh, the principles under which all of us have to be grown up, have to be, uh, have to be uh, developed as people. They just let people be whoever they want to be. And that leads to weakening the society, making the, the, the whole society weaker making individual people, they feel stronger because they can do whatever they want. They can be whoever they want. But the society in general becomes weaker and uh, and lose the power. The society loses the power. So that's my, um, 
more or less social understanding of what's happening if you look on the large perspective of time. So they just made their, their people uh, weaker by making them more free. Uh, next question, uh, is the entity concept in object-oriented programming okay to you when using it with JDBC? Like a book that implements entity and do validation and search and updating, I'm only exposing the key. Uh, well, uh, I, I don't think JDBC is about object-oriented programming in general. JDBC is the, is the connector, a very procedural, very imperative connector between the, uh, the Java world, uh, object-oriented, supposedly object-oriented world, with the world, with the world of, relation, of relational databases. So you just send requests there and you get some data back and that, then it's your job how to represent this data in the object-oriented world. So making things like entities to do that in my opinion, will only uh, create an illusion that you're doing object-oriented programming. So I would suggest to understand that JDBC is the data connector. It has nothing to do with, with uh, object-oriented programming and don't try to make it object-oriented. Relational world, you connect there, you ask the, the, the SQL database, please format the data to me in a table. And they return you the data, the table. And from that table, you fetch the line by line and then you think how this data fit into your object and then you make the real object. But don't use anything in between and call it an object. It's it, it's not. Um, what does it mean? Uh, what, are the, what, are the what are the letters in the beginning of the video mean? Well, this video is called F7. It means Friday. So F stands for Friday. So I'm trying in my channel, I'm trying to, um, to group videos into some sort of playlists and I give them letters, like the, the prefixes, in order to help you understand how many videos are there. So for example, you're watching right now F7. So you, you, you will understand that there are six videos previously and you can find them on the channel my channel just search for f6 f5 f4 just just some some sort of a structure just for your convenience and for my convenience too uh next question what do you think about sam uh, altman's dismiss dismissal from open ai um yeah that's an interesting story which just happening right now it actually happened in the last few days and now we, we see the consequences so what happened they they just somebody uh, according to my information, somebody just fired this guy, Sam Altman, who was, by the way, the previous, he was the founder, the co-founder of Y Combinator. So you probably know about this. Y Combinator is, a, uh, is the, the, the leading uh, incubator of startups in, in Silicon Valley, who, for example, incubated Airbnb. And that's one of their products. And uh, they also created, uh, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaking, um, the, the, the Dropbox which we all use. So the Dropbox and Airbnb, these are the startups which these guys incubated. So Sam Altman was the co-founder of that, of that story. But then he joined OpenAI. And suddenly last week, somebody just fired him. Well, officially it was announced like a, like a dismissal announced to him by the board of directors. There are tons of videos on the internet, tons of articles uh, on, on many websites, news websites, which explain to us what happened. But I don't think that we will be able to know the true story. We will, we will not be able to know the true players of this, of this setup. We don't know exactly who did what. We just, I saw the tweet from this guy, what's his name, Brookman or something, the, the second guy who was also uh, um, fired together with Sam. And he tweeted that, he said that uh, I, just, I just came to the office and my Gmail account and my Slack account, they're just disconnected. So they just removed my password and the same happened to Sam. So imagine you are the CEO of a company. So people who control your Gmail accounts, the corporate accounts, they are supposed to be reporting to you. So you are the CEO. You have the control of your people. You hired those people. They report to you every day. They say, yes, sir, we'll do what you, day, what, what you want us to do. And then suddenly you come to the office and they did what somebody else asked them to do. And according to the corporate law of America, as they, as they, uh, as they presented to us, uh, the board of directors is not, is not allowed to communicate directly with the employees of the company. The board of directors can only uh, ass assign the, the person to the position of a CEO. And this person will, do the, uh, the, will tell the employees what to do. Something happened, something else happened. So there are some other people who were involved who, in my opinion, they were not on the board of directors and they were not the employees. There were some third 
some third group of people who actually control this whole setup, who we don't know, and we will never know their names. So that's, you may sound, it may sound like a conspiracy theory, theory but in my opinion, it, it doesn't even make sense to us to discuss what happened. We just know that there are some, some events, um, they, 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 they were presented to us as some conflict between Sam, who is in favor of the growth of AI, uh, as they call uncontrolled growth of AI, and there is the board of directors, the people there who believe that the, the growth of AI must be controlled. So they were trying to, uh, to stop Sam and prevent them from prevent him from doing some wild things, and, and, and he, was, he was against that. That's the official story. But I don't buy it. I don't think this is this is what happened. But and it doesn't make any sense to discuss it to me because I don't know what happened. You don't know what happened. Even the people on YouTube who will tell you that they know what happened, they are only repeating you the stories which they read from the newspapers. Because the real story we don't know. It just sounds. It just looks very suspicious to me. It looks very uh, unclear what exactly happened. Because like I'm like I'm saying, there there are some practices in the corporate law of America where we exactly know what who does what and in what order but here something else happened and just uh, disconnecting the gmail account of a ceo of a company who can do that who is that person with such a power imagine i'm the ceo of my company yes i have investors i have the board of directors but my people is not going to listen to them my people will not disconnect my gmail account they will at least call me and say you know some guy from the board of directors just call me and said i'm going to disconnect your gmail account what do you think about that but the person who I just hired is my security guy, for example, who is responsible for my Gmail account on the, on the, on the corporate account. He's not going to listen to some board of directors. He doesn't even know them. He doesn't even know their names because he doesn't care. He reports to me. But no, he listened to them. Who were that people? We don't know. Uh, next question. Um, Hello from Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. Question, what other author's books can I read and inspired you about SQL speaking objects idea? Well, um, it's not just some book who you, which, you, which you should read to, but, uh, but you can, again, go to my blog. There is a search uh, field there, say books, and you will get a number of pages where I recommend exactly the books which you need to read. Unfortunately, most of those books are 20 years old. 2015, something like that. So I don't know any fresh books. If you do, please recommend in the comments section. Just, just tell me which books to read about good object-oriented programming, which are fresh. I only know the books which are so old. Um, next question. Uh, hello from La Plata, Argentina. Hello. What do you think about creating a functional wrapper on top of JDBC with the modern features of Java? I'm also not a big fan of ORM. Uh, yeah, anything you create on top of JDBC is fine, just as long as you do not expose JDBC to other objects. So keep the SQL language inside the object. That's why I call it SQL speaking object. So these objects, they understand SQL. They connect to the database. They send the request there. They get responses back. So they only speak that language, but nobody else. So don't spread SQL over the entire application. The application must speak object-oriented language, which is messages. So you call the method, you get the response, and that's it. But SQL stays within an object. How much you encapsulate, it's up to you. And I'm actually in, in, I'm against the ORM. I'm against the, uh, the hiding the SQL language from programmers. This is what ORM is doing. ORM is actually uh, helping you to not understand SQL. And this is a mistake. I think every programmer who is working with the data must understand SQL because it's, first of all, it's not so difficult. And second, when you understand SQL, you can write your requests to the database the way that they are most optimal. So it's important to understand SQL. You need to know that. So keep it, um, you know, try to, uh, try to learn it, try to, try to use it within, inside your objects. Next one. Um, uh, a question related to AI and testing. How close do you think we are to, we are to autonomous testing in this regard? And what's your forecast of how this might affect a, a QA automation engineers? Well, first of all, I have to say again and again that testers are not QA. So we should stop calling people who do testing QA people. QA is quality assurance. It's not about testing. Testing is uh, taking the product, the software product, breaking it, and reporting bugs which we find. 
Quality assurance is about observing the entire software development process, testing, programming, DevOps, management, and collecting the metrics from there, and then putting metrics together, and then making sure that there are no metrics which are in red zone, which we must pay attention to. So this is what quality assurance. The quality assurance is like a management uh, activity, and testing is breaking the product. So that's just a sidetrack comment. But if you're asking about um, AI and testing, I think that I think that testing is one of the first areas where AI will be uh, will be beneficial to use because uh, testing is uh, very boring in most cases, uh, especially when the system is uh, poorly designed and uh, and there are many uh, code duplication areas and where testing must be repeated over and over again. So it would be beneficial, of course, to ask AI. To, to write automated tests or maybe to just uh, to just imitate the user through the browser and go through the website and click all the different buttons. It's definitely coming, so we will have that. It's just inevitable. If you're interested, you can create something like that, but we will, we will have it. Um, but you know about AI, I was listening today to some podcasts and they were telling, they were, they were saying that uh, there is a huge risk that uh, that uh, AI will um, will will replace uh, programmers, uh, and it will happen immediately, all, very soon, all over the world. And the millions of programmers and testers, they will just lose their jobs. And um, uh, I don't think it will happen that fast. I, I and not because AI will not be able to to create the the tests automatically. It will. I think that in the next few months, we will get some software which will be able to create automated unit tests for a piece of Java code and then integration tests for a website and so on and so, and so forth. But uh, the, the adoption of this technology, the, the learning curve of this new concept is going to take us not even years, but decades. So that there are, there are millions of people who are not interested to learn anything new. There are millions of people who still write code in C language and the, and the C++ instead of using like more advanced languages like Rust, for example. There are millions of programmers who still use Java 6 or Java 4 instead of using the, the modern features of Java 8 or Java 11 or maybe Java 21. So they're, And they're in majority. So the people who are watching this channel and the people who read the books about AI, they are in minority. So you, how many people join this, 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 uh, this podcast? There are just a few hundred people. But there are millions of people who don't care. And these million, millions of people, they define what's on the market. They define uh, who, who a programmer is. So if you look at the programmer, a programmer, and I would ask you, please describe me, what do you, what do you know about the programmer? then the generic description of a programmer would be a person who learned programming 20 years ago in high school, who knows a little bit about some one programming language and who, uh, sorry, I, I think I, you lost me. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Something happened with my camera. Wait a second. I don't know what's that. Hope you can see me. I don't know what happened. Okay, sorry about that, guys. So where I was. Uh, so so yeah. So an average programmer is somebody who uh, who learned programming, like I said, twenty years ago. Who knows one programming language? Who doesn't care about AI, doesn't care about new technologies, it just does the same work over and over again every day. So this is an average programmer. So expecting this guy to just immediately start using AI to generate 
unit test. He doesn't, or she doesn't even know what is AI, doesn't even know what is unit testing, sorry. Doesn't even know what is testing, what are testing tests are for. So we, we should not be scared that much about this. But this time is coming, definitely. Testing is what AI is, uh, is going to help with. Uh, next question. What do you think of paying for tasks, not hours, and why nobody implemented it? Well, I'm a big fan of paying for, for tasks, definitely. I'm, in general, a big fan of, uh, of pay for results. Uh, model of uh, motivation of people. So I think that people are uh, must be motivated by the uh, by the rewards we give to them for their work, not by the our attitude to them, not by the the fake corporate values which we give to them. Well, not fake, but corporate values. So we tell them what we believe in, and we expect these people to share the values. I don't I don't think this is. This is fair to the people. I think people must be motivated by uh, a direct a financial uh, award which they get for the results they deliver. This is the most fair, the most objective, the most uh, uh, fruitful uh, way of contracting people. Uh, how exactly you do that, that depends on many factors. So many people will tell me that it's not possible. We don't know how to do it because programmers, they, they, uh, they, they work in the office. They spend their time on something. But how do we know how to measure that? So how much money we give them? Uh, because we don't know what they do, basically. We just see the result by the end of the year. We just see that the product is, has been developed some, somehow, magically. And we don't know who delivered what. We don't know exactly who wrote which code. Of course, we can calculate the lines of code written by some guy. But this metric is going to be very misleading because lines of code are not actually telling us anything about productivity. They're just blah, 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 blah. Long story about that. So people will tell you long, long explanations, excuses why it's not possible to measure who did what. There will be a lot of text about that. But again, I don't think it's 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 reasonable to listen to that. I think in most cases, those are mistakes or, or weaknesses. I would say even impotence of the management who cannot actually do the work management has to do to evaluate who does what, to break down the, the work into, uh, to break down the scope into pieces and then, and then, and then, uh, and then see, and see who is responsible for each piece. If you can do that, call it task, call it, call it ticket, call it uh, work package, call it whatever you want to call, call it a job, whatever. But make sure you call it somehow and you assign those pieces of work to some to somebody with the personal individual responsibility. And when they deliver, you check. You say, yes, you did it. You delivered that. And then you somehow connect the money to these uh, deliverables and you will see how productivity will productivity will boost you will see how the management will get the situation under control you will see how people will start contributing with a lot of enthusiasm and the people who don't contribute they will quickly get away they will click quickly start looking for different projects they will quickly start looking for different different companies even sometimes the people who you love, people who you believe are the good people in your team, they will just come to you and say, uh, this project is not exactly for me. I have some different life priorities, blah, blah, blah. Again, this is all blah, blah, blah. They just, um, they are just not productive. They see, they understand that they are less productive here than other people. So they, they, they want to go where the productivity is not being measured. It's my personal understanding, my personal experience talking now. Maybe in your situation, you will see something else. But this is how I understand people can be actually managed. Um, your ideas regarding management team using punishment and reward approach is very appealing. However, can I, can I, as a team leader, execute it in regular startup or corporate where salary is constantly paid? Well, I don't think it's possible. I thought I, I would actually... I would actually recommend you not to do that because you will become the enemy of the company and you will suffer. So all the punishment will go to you and you do that. Because like I said, if the company in the previous video, if the company is interested to pay people on a monthly basis, then the company on the highest level, they understand what's going on. Don't take your bosses for, for fools, you know, for idiots. They understand even better than you. They know what's going on. They know that there is no control. They know that the productivity is not, is not being measured. They know that programmers just sitting in the office and, and most of them pretend to be, work, to, to be working. They realize that. And then if you come to them and say, I want to change something and actually I want to make, it to make the changes inside my department, not in the whole company, but inside my department, then you, you, you compromise their... Uh, their professional uh, 
capability of, of understanding what's going on. So you're basically telling them that you are idiots. I'm smarter than you. You will be uh, you will be in trouble if you do that. The best you can do is you go to the top management of the company if you can. If you are in a small company, then you can possibly reach the top management and try to a little bit to talk and ask them what do they think in general whether this company, whether the people in this company, the programmers are being productive as they could be, whether the whether they're happy. So don't tell them that you think that the people are lazy. You think that people are not, uh, you know, not being uh, effective as effective as they could be. Just ask them what they think and listen to what they say. And in most cases, you will hear that, yes, our company is doing great. We have very great talents. We have very good people. So just, just say, yeah, I like, I agree totally. Just go back to your cage. So don't argue with the top management. When you have your own startup, then you will define your own rules. But in existing company, just um, if you if you have people who are, uh, not productive, and you want to make them more productive, then again, don't do that. Just ignore them. Just focus on people who are the best people, the people who work a lot, who who are who are productive by um, you know without any reward. And these people exist. There are people who will work a lot, even if you pay them nothing. They will just work a lot. They love to work. And these people are in minority. Maybe twenty percent of people are like that. Eighty percent of people. They they are lazy, incompetent, not interested in any work. They're just coming to the office to get the salary. That's all. So if you tell them that you're going to get the salary for just for, for doing nothing and you don't even need to go to the office, they will write zero lines of code during the month. Zero. They will do nothing, like literally nothing. And that's how 80% of people will behave. 20% of people will say, yeah, I don't care. I'm getting money because, yeah, I need this money to, to pay my bills. But I'm still going to write code. That's just that's just what I love to do. So work with the, with these people. Focus on them. Ignore the other eighty percent. Not completely ignore, but don't waste your time there. Don't try to motivate them. Don't try to tell them to teach them, to mentor them, to help them. Just look at them. Just close your eyes on their laziness, and that's it. That that will save you from from the troubles, and will actually help you to achieve some results with the people who actually need your attention. These twenty percent. Next one, um, how do you think Elon Musk feels after another Starship launch failure? What keeps him going? Uh, well, I think that uh, Elon Musk is not, doesn't really care about these failures of some Starship rockets he tries to send to the space, uh, whatever. I don't think that, uh, uh, that Elon Musk is the decision maker there and uh, is the person who is in charge. I think Elon Musk is a is a public figure, is a very effective public figure. He attracts attention. He knows how to talk on Twitter. He knows how to 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 give interviews. He is uh, capable of writing books, uh, of uh, I don't know, publicly getting married, making kids, all that stuff. So he's like an actor. He's like a like George Clooney. So. He's a very likable person. We all like him because we, we 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 want some we want to like somebody, but he's not a decision maker. So people who make decisions, they uh, they need they, they are okay with failures because uh, uh, th these people, I believe, are in charge of way larger resources than we can see, and and um, the purpose of these resources, the purpose of this activity with the space investigation, with launching the, those rockets, is to I think is to um, uh, is mostly to keep people busy, uh, to keep smart people busy, like scientists, people with the brains, and um, and it, and if the the rocket fails, then it, it's even better because it's there are challenges then. Then people ask questions. So why did it fail? What do we need to do next? What's the next step? What we did? What did we do wrong? And it's good because people think, people work, people stay busy, and uh, millions of people want to be like these people. So well, millions of people want to join NASA and 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 invest, investigate space, and work with Elon Musk, and that's good for the country, and good for America. So if those launches are happening in America and there's Elon Musk there and that their their American dream there that you can become a Elon Musk, you can become a billionaire. So a lot of talents will go to America and they will stay busy with that kind of problems, with the scientific problems. 
And that's good for the country. It's good for people who are in charge of the country. So I, I totally agree with them. If I would be on their place, I would definitely invest a lot of resources into activities which are not giving direct outcome, which even give you the, the, the negative outcome. They're just the rockets. They fail. They fall down. They blow up on the, in the space. And that's perfect because it's the material for research. Negative result is also, it also is a result. How many countries do you know in the world who actually have the ability to launch such things in the, into space? America, India, China, Russia, that's it. So Brazil, for example, or I don't know, uh, some Sri Lanka or Thailand, they don't do that, right? So they just, uh, they just do something else. Why? Because they don't have resources. And that's why people who are scientists, who, are, who have ambition, who have some... Uh, some big goals on their life, they move to the countries which I just called, which I just named, but not to Thailand or, uh, I don't know, some other country, I don't know, Kazakhstan, for example, because uh, uh, because they, have, they don't invest resources into that kind of activities. So it's good for America. Every failure, it's okay, as long as they have some activity, as long as the, the, the process is going. Uh, Next one, as project manager, how do you approach estimation of project where new tech involved? For example, migration to time series database research can take a couple of days or much longer than that. Thanks. Well, uh, research um, must be any, any work, any project, any activity in order to be manageable must be broken down into pieces. And, and the smaller the pieces, the more manageable is the project. That's just, it's just a, an axiom which all, every manager must know. Uh, if you cannot break down your research activity into pieces, then, uh, then just step away as a project manager. You just have nothing to do there because then it's just magic. It's not actually a project. It's just, it's just some magic which magically will deliver the result or maybe not. It's like gambling. So how do you break down the research project into pieces? Um, it's possible. So talk to any researcher, talk to any programmer, uh, you just make experiments one by one from smaller to larger. So if you want to make, if you want to, let's say, move to a different database and you don't know the outcome, whether it will work or not, maybe it will not, you just make an experiment, the small one, you try with a small version on a small server just to experiment. Then you confirm the experiment, yes or no. From these results, from the results of this experiment, you move further, you make a larger experiment. You involve more resources, you involve more software, more hardware, and then so on and so forth. From, from small experiment to larger and larger and larger. I think it's very generic advice I'm giving you now. But in general, this is how I would approach a research project. Just make something small. You know, there's a very, a very um, uh, famous uh, picture on the internet which, which tells you uh, how you develop a startup. So you don't build just uh, the, the first approach is that you, that you, they, they make a metaphor using a car. So the first approach is that you you build a wheel, and then you build uh, you build a, an engine, and then you build uh, uh, the the box for the car, and then you build the, the seats for the car, and then you put all these pieces together, and boom, you have a car. This is a wrong approach. But the right approach is that you build a bicycle first. And then you build a motorcycle from the bicycle. And then the, from a motorcycle, you build a motorcycle with three wheels. And then from the motorcycle with three wheels, you build a car. So you, you evolve your solution from a smaller one, from a prototype, which is a bicycle, to a full working version, which is a car. So when you do the research like this, like migrating to a new database, so build a bicycle first. Build something which will prove to you that you have uh, that you have a potential that that the whole thing will work. So you reduce the risk of the total failure by making experiments from small one to larger and larger. Um, uh, next question. I just don't know in general how is the Russia software market. What are the chances of a software developer who doesn't know Russia working in the Russian market? Uh, well, I think if you don't uh, speak Russian, you have a lot of chances to, to be welcomed in the Russian market. And actually, you have, I think, even more chances than Russian people. 
than people who speak Russian and uh, and they 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 speak English as a foreign language. Because Russia right now is uh, the country where there are not so many foreign people right now because of these sanctions and because of the uh, this military situation uh, with Ukraine. So so people are not moving here as actively as they were moving like five years ago. So he, if you move now to the Russian market, you will be a foreigner who speaks English, and that will be uh, you will be quite unique, and that will be a ra- you'll be a rare species. And everybody, I think, will love you. And you will easily find a job in the company because you will be able to speak English. You will be able to read the documentation. You will help other people to learn English. So the majority of people in the team will have to talk to you in English. It's only good for the development of the team you know, culture of, of communication and so on and so forth. So if, if you come to me, for example, to my team and you say, I don't speak Russian, I only speak English, I would consider that as an advantage, not as a disadvantage. And I think most of the managers will take it like this, unless it's a very uh, government-oriented company where they develop the software written in speaking Russian only, and uh, even the code is being documented in Russian. These companies exist, of course, but um, I don't think we. it's, it's such a pleasure to work for them. Next one, how to stop using static methods. For example, there is a method that calculates some math expression and is used everywhere in the project. Should I... um, uh, uh, Should it be implemented in every class? Well, instead of a static method, you just make a class. So you you have some functionality which you want to share among many, many classes. and, And you make a static method which does some algorithm calculation for that. Make a class. And then everywhere where we need to use it, just make new instance of this class and call the method on this class and the calculation will happen. It may be a little bit slower, of course, because making an instance of a class is faster than calling a static method. But in the majority of cases, the performance is not that critical. It's not that critical. Sometimes it will be critical. Sometimes in this case, yes, you use static method. But in most cases, making an object, making an instance of an object of a class is okay. Next question, Um, and again, we're getting back to this encapsulation question, like adding a book to the database. Uh, Maybe I choose other name instead of entity to represent that. Uh, Again, to answer you, well, you're kind of asking a very specific question, but in general, I can only give you the general answer because you don't show me the specific code. So in general, we don't make... um, uh, we don't deal with a book. We don't deal with an entity when we talk to the database. The database doesn't understand object-oriented language. So there is no entity for the database. The database understands tables, understands columns, understands cells. So that's why you need to draw a clear line between the book and the line in the database table, the raw. So trying to move the idea of a book to the database is a wrong concept. Don't do that. I believe so. Um, next one. Uh, Binance. Alisa, <laughs> stoy. So I think uh, she reacted to Binance. Uh, Binance admitted to money laundering after which the company's CEO left his post. Do you think cryptocurrencies benefit society or rock the bow, the boat? Um well, uh, that's an interesting story. Again, last week it happened. Actually, now it's happening. So Binance is definitely the largest company on the cryptocurrency market, and they have uh, and they were they were under pressure over the last four years. They they actually are five years old. So they cre- they were funded, uh, they were founded, they were found, uh, they were created five years ago or six years ago, and in six months it became the largest exchange on the planet. Again, I do not believe that this happened because of a management talent of this, this guy, the Zhao or CZ, or what it's called. I don't think it's it's because of that. I think there, there are some other people staying behind this company and putting this guy as a front man, as, a, as an actor, as George, as, as George Clooney, who is telling us that this is, this is, a, this is a, a private business which was created magically and 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 became some became so popular that's one story second story they are being pushing this company specifically and trying to 
uh, they. Again, the second question is who is fighting against this company? So who is trying to put it away, away from the market or to control over this company? And they are now asking this company to pay $4 billion as a, as a penalty. But at the same time, this company is not operating in the United States of America. So they are, and, and at the same time, the company said that they are okay to pay the fine. My question is, where is this $4 billion staying? So in which bank account they keep this money? $4 billion. It's not cash, right? It's not, it's, it has to be United States dollars on the bank account of some American bank. But at the same time, it's this company doesn't exist in America. So it's illegal in America. It operates from outside of America. Even if you are an American customer, you cannot get an account on, on, this, on this company. So where is the money? Where is this $4 billion? And they said, okay, we're going to pay this money. And the American regulation, uh, this SEC uh, committee said, okay, sure, send us, send us the check. So how it's going to be exactly. So my, my point is that this is all one big gang of people who, who, are, who are just telling us what's happening, but in reality, something else is happening. So, and at the same, and also <laughs> keep in mind that this cryptocurrency market is 99% illegal market. So 99% of transactions on cryptocurrencies, they are associated with money laundering, associated with, uh, with drugs, associated with terrorism, associated with armor trade, all that stuff. Because, because of this is, this is what it's for. So the, this Bitcoin is cre was created as, a, as an alternative to the money mechanisms which are controlled by the government. So this is something which we don't want the government to see. And that's why it's mostly for criminal activity. So now they are, uh, they are trying to, uh, to, put this criminal, to, to put this criminal activity under, uh, under control. Somebody. We don't know who. Well, definitely, they're not the people from SEC. They're not the prosecutors. They're not this uh, these, these law people who are fighting for the, uh, you know, for for the for the um, uh, for the security of the nation, for the for the protection of people. It's not about that. It's it's they're trying to uh, to 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 get control over the the crypto market, and maybe it's also associated with the war. Uh, between the two worlds, between America and Russia or America and China. So this Bitcoin is actively used right now for the transactions between, the, uh, between these two territories. And uh, because the, 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 the SWIFT is not working anymore between, for example, Russia and America, but somehow, you know, let's say drugs, which are, which are being purchased by Russia, I mean, illegal drugs every day, every month, they have to be purchased somehow. So we need to transfer the money from Russia to uh, to let's say where the money Colombia. So how how does it work? It works through Bitcoin. Where do you, do they change the Bitcoin from Bitcoin to uh, to uh, to actual cash? They use systems like uh, Binance, but Binance is basically the platform for 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 people who are um, who are who are trading this cash to uh, to cryptocurrencies. So long story short, short, it's all about crime. It's all about dark money. It's all about dark, uh, dark territory of finance. And um, what's happening again? We don't know, and it's only only our speculations. I don't know exactly what's happening. I'm just I'm just looking at the the facts, and I'm asking myself the questions. And I, I understand that uh, uh, that it seems that uh, there are forces who are trying to uh, to put this Bitcoin story under some control. Is it good? Is it bad? I'm not sure. I, 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 I did believe in Bitcoin before. I was thinking that it may be, it may, a long time ago when it, when it started, I was thinking that maybe it, it could be the, uh, the mechanism for, uh, for actually sending money from people to people instead of dollars, instead of rubles, instead of bank bank accounts and bank systems, but uh, it, it quickly became obvious that this system is not suitable for uh, for convenient uh, money exchanges because it's very expensive. First of all, all transactions all transactions are very expensive, and uh, at the same time very slow, and at the same time extremely criminalized. This whole territory, and in most play in most countries. The, the Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, they are criminalized. But at the same time, somehow, 
the, the people can buy those currencies and can sell those currencies. So they can exchange them to cash, exchange them to real money. And it happens in every country. So by definition, this, this, this cryptocurrency is, uh, is the, 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 the thing which people can only get by committing some crime, by exchanging their hard-earned money to these you know, digital numbers. I don't think I answered your question, but I, I tried to explain my attitude to this. Next question. DHH has removed TypeScript from the front-end framework, Turbo. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know who is Turbo, and I, I know who is DHH, and I don't know anything about TypeScript, mostly. Um, so I believe DHH doesn't like TypeScript, which is bad or good i don't know javascript i like typescript i probably like less because i think uh, javascript has its beauty in its uh, typeless classless prototype based design some people don't like it many people don't like it many people consider javascript not a real programming language they just uh, they just um uh, they diminish, if I can use this word, they diminish uh, the value of JavaScript because it's not Java, because it's not C++, because it doesn't have types, it doesn't have many other things. But in my opinion, JavaScript is way better designed as a language comparing to Java and comparing to C++. It has its own beauty, it has its own concept, it has its own uh, philosophy. And actually, the, the book which I wrote, The Junior Objects, this is the book I wrote three years ago. It's called Junior Objects. This is my last book, actually. Uh, not, not the last one, but the, the, the fifth one, because <laughs> I'm going to write more books. So in this book, I'm using JavaScript to explain object-oriented programming. Not Java, not C++. I'm using JavaScript without classes to explain object-oriented programming. And I decided to choose this language because I believe that this is the language which has the the best, the most pure, the most elegant object-oriented um, concept, the, the paradigm of uh, of objects. So, and TypeScript is trying to get away from that. TypeScript is trying to marry Java with JavaScript. So they are bringing types in there. They are bringing some uh, many other things which do not belong there, in my opinion. They just they just trying to 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 move uh, to help conventional programmers who are used to Java, used to C++, to move to the, to the world of JavaScript. Well, in my opinion, it's not uh, an honorable mission. Let's put it this way. Next one. If you are the president of Russia, what is your short and long-term plan? Uh, <laughs> well, that's a tough question. Um, I would... Well, I would definitely uh, try to uh, find peace with uh, with uh, as many countries as possible. I would definitely try to um, to to uh, to decrease the level of uh, of the sanctions which Russia put on Russia puts on foreign countries because the sanctions are two ways, right? Right now, so the 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 Western the Western world, like, like Europe and the United States of America, they put the sanctions on Russia, and such and Russia puts some sanctions back. The Russia prohibits, for example, the import from from Europe to to Russia of their foreign of of the European uh, food, European furniture, for example, for European clothes and all that stuff. I would try to reduce that. That's the short-term plan to just find pieces as 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 fast as possible. Just, just be, um, you know. Um, uh, I think in general the war for Russia and the the, the, the situation of the, the isolate the situation of isolation is not beneficial to Russia right now. On a short-term term plan, on a long-term plan, uh, I would try to, um, uh, well. Maybe that's an interesting question. I was not thinking about this before. So maybe in the long term, I would try to invest as much as possible into education, into culture, into uh, the development of uh, young generation, into schools, into universities, uh, that kind of stuff. And um, sorry, my.
my camera. I don't know why it keeps disconnecting. Yeah, so so I would uh, I would try to invest into into education. I don't know. I mean, I'm saying something obvious right now, but uh, if to think more, I don't know exactly how to do that. So I'm saying invest more. But Russia is investing a lot into into education, into development of young generation. What, what exactly can be do can be done better? Can can be done more than that? And we, we it's. I think that the mistake which most of us are making is believing that the president of the country is actually the decision maker who, who can just sign a piece of paper and, and magically the whole country will change. And most and a lot of people believe that if we change the president, if we elect somebody else, then that guy will, will, will step in and will sign the number of papers and boom, the whole situation will change. But it's it's not like that. We, we, this this guy is not a is not as powerful <laughs> as as we can imagine. There are a lot of people who are who who hold this system the way it is now, who are embedded into this system. The people who own the, the system, the people who own the factories, they own the the media, they own the hospitals, they own the roads, they own land, they own a lot of things. They they you cannot just sign one paper and then make all of these people live different life. They will try to continue living the life they live right now. And in order to change the way they live, we need to, I mean, it takes a lot of time. We need to slowly and slowly uh, identify um, the, the habits, identify the, uh, the principles which, which we don't like and then try to the principles which are embedded into the heads of these people. So these people they live according to certain to certain principles, to certain ideas. They they believe in something. They, for example, they believe in 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 um, I don't know in in the, in capitalism. They believe in private property. They believe that that uh, the less you the more you own and the less you work, the more happy you are. For example, this is the concept which we have in the heads of people, which actually is true. This is what most people believe in this country right now. So the less you work, the more you own, the more capital you control, the happier you the happier you will be, the happier the happier will be your family. Every like everybody who who are who, are, who stay next to you, your your community will be better if you not work, but if you control the capital, control the assets. And this is the, 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 the philosophy which, which is embedded into the society. And to remove this from the heads of the people, that, that may take a lot of years. And one guy cannot do this just in, in a few days. We need to slowly, step by step, somehow cultivate the value of the, 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 you know, the, the honest work, <laughs> the value of honest contribution to the society. For example, if that's just, just, just giving you one example. Or for example, people believe that um, I don't know, drinking a lot of alcohol is the solution to the majority of problems. And that's the philosophy which affects the entire society, the entire, the entire the millions of people. So how do we change that? How do we fix that? It definitely is not good for the, for the society. And let's say I'm a president of the country. So how do I change that? I cannot just sign a paper, stop drinking, no more alcohol, more than one bottle a month, for example. That will be just weird. I mean, I'm not going to be the president in the next few days because the whole society will be rejecting that idea and I will be dismissed very soon, maybe even killed. So, so it has to be a group of people together with the president. It has to be a large group of people who share the same ideas. And then we need to step by step, slowly, trying to improve the, the mindset of the people who make decisions in every city in every place, in every small town. So how to do that? I mean, maybe it is, uh, I mean, um, it is, it is very important strategically, but maybe it's even larger than the lifetime of a single pres president. So just saying that I can do that, just give me five years. I mean, the president would say that, give me five years and I'll do that. I don't think that, um, that it's, that may sound like a, like anything uh, trustable. So we, being a president, strategically, it should be the person who, um, 
who postulate who um, who claim the philosophy of the entire society. It's not the person who signs the the paper and says fix this hospital or spend money on this or immediately fix this road because people cannot drive there. There is no road there. So immediately fix. This is my direct paper. This is not what the president has supposed to be. The president has to establish and, and um, uh, enforce new principles or improved principles of how the society lives. And in order to do that, the, the president has to use all the possible instruments like media, like because the president has the power. The president has a lot of trust. The majority of people trust that guy. And if this guy says, I believe this is how we should live. I believe this is the right direction. And, and defining this direction and writing papers about this and making speeches about this, this is the job of a president, I think so. Just um, formulating uh, the principles of life. And if the president, and if one president formulates those principles, the second president formulates this, those principles, next president, so if, they ch if the presidents change, but the principles stay, then the society will be, will be stable and will grow and grow, like America. So in America, every president, they change the president, but they keep formulating the same principles. The principles sound like, uh, uh, you know, collect the assets, become a capitalist and, and live a happy life. And those principles are being there for, for 200 years. No matter how many presidents you change, you don't change them. So somebody in America or some group of people, probably a large group of people, they are they are holding those principles and they do not let those principles get away. In Russia, we change our principles of life every few decades. Every single, the next president comes in and, and starts talking about something else. And this is what makes life so difficult here. So being a president, I would try to, to answer your question, to, to finish my, my long story, I would try to, uh, to somehow formulate uh, the basic uh, the basic uh, uh, paradigm of life, the basic concept of what people in this country believe into, like who we are, and focus on that more and more and more. And that will probably change life of the majority of people. Long story. Excuse me for taking so long, but it's an interesting question. What do you think about Vision Pro? Will, will Apple be able to change the game? Vision Pro. I have no idea what is... What is Vision Pro? Sorry about that, but I will Google, and next time I'll throw, try to answer. Again, about SQL speaking objects. That takes too long. Please read my blog. That's too much. Um, again, about, about SQL speaking objects. Uh, what author book exactly inspired you about this idea? Uh, it was not just one book which inspired me. It was just coding practices. The majority of the things which I wrote on my blog, they are coming from my programming practices. I'm not, I'm not a book writer. This is not my, this is not my job description. I don't make money from book writing. I never wanted to be a book writer. It's just something that I cannot hold in myself. So I'm just coding and I see how many mistakes we make. I see how bad is the code that my colleague programmers write. And I want to tell them that that they should do differently. And then I I I formulated this idea for myself. I tried it many, many times, and then I put it on the blog. So it was not like I was sitting there and thinking, okay, what's my next idea? Probably my next idea will be this, and let me formulate it. No, it's coming from practice, and, and, and I, I suggest you do the same. Like what you write, what you code, start a small blog post and write there what you don't like. So that's that's actually the main principle of writing. If you If you hate something, then you write about it. If you love something, don't, don't write because your writing will be boring. So write when you hate, when you see something that you don't like, you dislike, and then you, you want to oppose something to that. So you see some wrongdoing, you see the evil in this world, like bad programming practices, then write about it. This is how, as, this is how SQL speaking objects, they, they showed up. Because I saw mistakes people make, and I was so angry about that, that I eventually suggested that. Uh, do you approve duplicating some validation checks in the SQL database, not just in the application side? Is this the way to go really ensure data integrity? Oh, definitely, definitely, 100%. Actually, I believe that it's better to keep uh, valid these, these integrity checks inside the database and do not uh, duplicate them into the code. 
So first comes the database. The database must protect itself. The code may be different. Today it may be Java. Tomorrow it's going to be uh, Python. And, and you will have to write twice. You will have to write this, uh, this, uh, uh, this mechanism of control uh, twice, the, the, the integrity checks. You don't do that. You, you want to do it only once. So, so the database is king. Database is king. That's important. Database defines the rules. The Java is just a secondary uh, actor. <laughs> database is the primary one. Uh, okay, next question. What's your take on hypermedia systems as seen with HTMX? For those who don't know, it's like Turbo or Ruby of, of Ruby, which follows the HTML over the wire instead of always relying on JSON API. That's something interesting, but I don't know about it. I will Google HTMX. I don't know what it is. Uh, next one. We are running to out of time. But we have a few more questions. Uh, appreciate the work. Really interested to know your opinion on religion. <laughs> I assume you are an atheist, agnostic from what I saw, but still really excited to hear your thoughts. Well, uh, agnostic maybe. I, I, I definitely do not believe 100% in physics, in the laws of physics. That's just would be silly, I think, to believe in, in what the, 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 the laws are telling us because they change those laws. Uh, once in a while, and we definitely don't know a lot of things about us, definitely. But uh, I'm definitely not religious, so uh, I'm, 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 but inventing uh, uh, a theory, which is religion, is something that uh, I think is, um, uh, is a solution, definitely, is an answer to people who don't have the, the proper answer. People, and most of us, we don't have the proper answer. We don't know, for example, uh, what happens to us when we die. And there is no answer to that. And nobody can provide us the answer except the religion, except the church. The church gives the answer and no other answer exists. And maybe it is good to provide this answer to the to the people who uh, who are looking for the answer. For example, we don't have an answer why I, I work my whole life honestly, for example, not me, but just the person may ask that. I work the whole life honestly, but, uh, and, and then my neighbor just steals, you know, just, just steals money and, and, and take bribes and a very corrupted, uh, corrupted criminal, and he lives way better life than me. So why it happens? Where is the, <clears throat> where is the judgment? What, what, who will judge this situation? Who will punish him eventually? And will I be eventually uh, rewarded for my for my good life for, for actually following the rules of of God, following the uh, the principles of good life, and, and so on and so forth? There are no answer for that. We don't know whether it will happen or not. We just and and people are looking for those answers. And church it gives the answers. So I I appreciate that. I mean, it helps. Without that, without church, it will be it would be very difficult for the majority of people to live. Uh, it would be not many people, not not so many people are strong enough to accept the fact that there is no answer. That, uh, or for example, that when you die, just nothing happens after that. You just you just a piece of meat, and that's it. You just just disappear. So, not so many people are strong enough to accept that. Um, but I believe that. We must try, as a society, we must try to increase the number of strong people. And religion is decreasing the number of strong people. Religion is helping people by giving them the answers which are tasty, which are sweet, but they are, um, um, but they are probably fake. They, they are probably mm, synthetic. They are probably not based on on reality. They're not based on facts. They just they're just made up. And and people who live on on the facts on on the beliefs that are, that are made up, are definitely not the strongest uh, the strongest people. So I in general believe in people. I in general believe that people must be improved. That people must be educated, improved. They must be become stronger. They we we must help people to get stronger. And the church is okay as a temporary solution, as a solution for the war time, for example. When people go to war, uh, it's not the time to tell them that, you know, you're just a piece of meat and when you die, nothing happens. It's better to tell them that when you die, you 
you you you join the, the heaven and and that's that's going to be even better than your life now this is how you help people to to get into a battle and die there so it is a help definitely but so religion is definitely a helpful instrument to 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 help people survive but on the long term i'm not religious and i believe we need a better a better uh uh, recipe for people. Uh, there's a question about Bitcoin. I just told you about it. Uh, are you familiar with Mongo? Yeah, I use Mongo a little bit in a few of my projects, and I'm I, I can say, well, it happened to me once when I had a database, the, the Mongo database. I was running it on my server, and then uh, I had the data there, and I I misconfigured the back the backup script, so I basically didn't have the backup. And then I just restarted the Mongo database and the whole data was lost. So I just lost the entire database, the entire data set. And I started Googling that and I found out that Mongo is a database with this kind of problem. So when you shut it down, it may corrupt your data and you will never be able to restore it. So after that incident, which happened to me, I think three years ago, I'm not so happy about Mongo anymore. So I consider it as a temporary database. When you hold, when you, can, when you persist your data, which you don't care about that much. So if you lose it, then you don't care. But maybe you can use it for something better. Okay, one final question, and we are done for today. Uh, uh, um, uh, we see, okay, maybe, okay, the question about Ukraine. Mm, okay, what, okay, I'll answer about Ukraine and then about our programming language. Uh, what do you think about, what do you think will happen to Ukraine? Um, well, I think uh, uh, there are two answers. What I want to happen to Ukraine and what I think will happen to Ukraine. First, uh, what I want to happen to Ukraine, I want it to be, uh, I want it to, uh, well, I want it to, again, it's the same to Russia. I want it to lower the temperature of the, of the aggression which, uh, which it exposes, definitely not unprovoked, because definitely, it has the country and the government has some moral rights to be defensive and to be aggressive towards Russia. Uh, and but I think that it would be great if Ukraine would understand the reality, understand that that peace is better than war, understand that at some point of time we need to uh, we need to become brothers again with Russian people because I'm from Ukraine and, and this is my country, my, my territory. I don't, I don't think exactly what is the country right now because it, it, lo it lost a lot of pieces, a lot of territory, a lot of big chunks of territory. So I, I am from there. I was born there. I lived my life there. So I, I, would, I would love Ukraine to, uh, to, to, to understand that it's inevitable that Ukrainian people and Russian people will be brothers again. The question is when, the question is how soon, and the question is how much we're going to pay for that, how much more we're going to pay for that, and and it's it's the responsibility of Ukrainian people and Russian people to lower the price, because there is some prices. The price will be paid. So if you look into the future, the war, it never happens that the war never ends. The war ends. There will be the end. There will be the stopping, the, the point of, 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 of even the, the war, the Second World War, which was ex way more uh, aggressive, which were way larger. But still, Russia and Germany, they were friends after the war. So the war stopped. They did some punishment of some people who were involved in the war. And boom, the peace is there. And we were good friends with Germany. Well, now, again, we're not good friends. Well, we either. I mean, Russia. So the same will happen between Russia and Ukraine. There will be peace. And how much, how soon, and how much we're going to pay for this peace? That's the question. So I suggest uh, Ukrainian, uh, I, I would love, not I suggest, I would love uh, to get as soon as possible to the peacemaking point. What will happen, and now your question, what I think will happen, uh, I think that uh, there are not two parties involved, not just Russia and Ukraine. I actually don't even think that Russia and Ukraine are the subjects 
of this conflict are the decision making uh, party, parties in this conflict i think that there is it's a larger um, landscape it's a larger map of 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 the game and on this map um, i think there is one group of people who are responsible for this conflict and they are the beneficiaries who are getting the, the the value from all this and i don't think they live in moscow or they live in <clears throat> new york or they live in kiev i think they live everywhere i think this group of people they are just uh, they are just the people who um, who just who are responsible for the the finance of this of this of the world who are responsible for the future of this civilization of the humanity and they have some plan and uh, and they will uh, continue uh, this conflict uh, even though the price which we pay we people from ukraine and from russia we pay this price but uh, it is necessary for this group of people that we pay this price and they probably want us to pay as much as possible including our economy including our lives including our soldiers including the the destroyed territories destroyed cities including killed people all of this is the price which we pay and they want us to 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 do it why i don't know that's a that's a it's a long big question why they need this why they are they they they, they continue this uh, this conflict and, and they even they they not even can they don't even uh, develop it but they hold it in a stable situation right now again making us pay the price Every day we we'll lose, we'll lose something. Every day we we'll lose. We we'll lose the time first of all. That's the the biggest. That's the biggest uh, thing which we we'll lose. The, the world is moving forward in their development of new technologies, in their in their growth of their education, and the growth of the technologies, and the glow in, in the growth of everything. But at the same time, a huge block of a huge. Uh, uh, a massive amount of uh, of people and resources in Ukraine and in Russia are busy on 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 keeping this conflict on fire. So probably this is very beneficial for those who are not planning to build Silicon Valley in Russia or Ukraine. I think it's very beneficial for people who are building Silicon Valley in Silicon Valley. That's my understanding. So this is what will happen. The conflict will be on and on. It will go on and on and on and on until uh, maybe it will be very, it may be quite, uh, quite long. It, it may be like uh, Israeli and Israel slash Palestinian conflict, which is, which is there for, I don't know, 50 years or 60 years. So we may have the same uh, with Ukraine, unfortunately. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, and your question about our programming language. Yes, we do develop our programming language. If you're interested, you can join. It's called eolang.org. Uh, we are, we have a lot of progress, actually. We are, we're making changes every day and we add new features. We remove some other features. So the language becomes more and more mature. We, we better and better formulate the concept of the language. So if you compare our understanding of the language now with the understanding two years ago when we, when we actively started working on it, that's completely two different understandings. So now we believe that we have way more, way more mature and way more stable understanding of, um, of, the, of what we want to achieve. Uh, so that's it for now. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. Sorry about the camera. I don't know why it was disconnecting. See you next time. It's every Friday at 6 o'clock Moscow time. Bye-bye.